Thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad to um, be here today. Thank you for the warm welcome. So I, again, am Vice Chair Janaea Scott, and I oversee the Energy Commission's research portfolio. And so I'm going to talk to you for just a few minutes about what the Energy Commission is doing um, overall. And then I'll jump in and do a little bit of a deeper dive into our research program. And then I look forward very much to um, hearing the questions from everybody this afternoon. So um, as you all know, Governor Newsom has set some bold goals for our state in terms of climate, um, in terms of clean air, and also uh, in terms of equity. So you can see here um, one of the quotes that he had uh, made just about a month or so ago, uh, talking about why it is nice to have goals to get to 100% clean energy by 2045. It's inadequate to meet the challenges of the state. Um, and as you all know, there is a lot of work that we need to do on a very fast time frame in order to keep global warming uh, under two degrees Celsius um, around the world. So uh, at the Energy Commission, we are in some ways kind of like uh, the governor's energy office. We have more than uh, 700 staff, uh, almost 800 staff that work at the commission on a broad set of things. The commission is overseen by um, five commissioners. In order to be a commissioner at the Energy Commission, you need to be uh, appointed by the governor and then uh, confirmed by the, the state Senate. And each of us has a, uh, a designation. I'm designated as the public member of the Energy Commission um, and also as the vice chair. And I oversee our research portfolio. So each of the five of us has sort of a portfolio of energy related topics that we oversee on any given day. So what I wanted to do, as I mentioned, is give you kind of a high level overview of some of the core responsibilities of what the Energy Commission does. Pretty much anything that you can think of that touches energy at some point or place will come through uh, the Energy Commission. But I wanted to highlight for you our core responsibilities. And then as I mentioned, I will do a deep dive into the research that we're working on. So one of our core responsibilities is to certify thermal power plants that are 50 megawatts or larger. Um, I really like the slide that goes here with this because it is, it actually is thermal power plants. So if you're talking about solar PV, that does not have a solar uh, a thermal component, and therefore the Energy Commission does not typically do the permitting for that. Um, and also wind, right? So wind power does not have a thermal component to it. The Energy Commission does not do the permitting for those types of facilities either. That tends to go through the counties. So anything that has a thermal component that's 50 megawatts or bigger comes through the Energy Commission, and we do all of the environmental reviews for those projects to determine whether or not they're able to go forward. Another one of our core responsibilities is in the transportation sector. The transportation sector in California is responsible for about 40% of the greenhouse gases in California. And if you um, include refining in that as well, then it's more than 50% of the greenhouse gas uh, portfolio in California is coming from our transportation sector. The Energy Commission has about $100 million that we invest each year in transforming transportation. And some of the things that we work on in that space include helping um, get out some of the charging infrastructure. We're helping to build some of the hydrogen stations that you see around the state. We help a lot with um, cleaner, low uh, carbon fuels. Um, and we have a little bit of a workforce training component and a manufacturing component to that as well but it's $100 million that the Energy Commission invests each year in transforming transportation. A third of our responsibilities is the research portfolio, and I'm not gonna to say too much more about that right here because I will talk with you um, about that in great detail for the rest of my presentation. Um, a fourth responsibility at the Energy Commission is forecasting our future energy needs. And the Energy Commission actually has a crackerjack set of people. They are world-class analysts in looking at uh, our energy needs. So they look at electricity supply and demand, they look at natural gas supply and demand, they look at petroleum supply and demand, and often people from like the, um, the EIA, the International um, Energy Agency, the IEA, and others will look to the Energy Commission to, to see some of the research and forecasting that we're doing in this space. It, it's pretty powerful, and the forecasting needs are what a lot of the planning in the state is, um, Go, it works around, right? So you forecast, here's how much electricity demand we think that we have. 
So when people are looking at procurement, how much um, energy procurement do we need to do? What level of renewables do we need? All of that kind of ties back to that forecast for where we think um, electricity demand is going to be. A fifth thing that we work on at the Energy Commission is deploying our renewable energy resources. And really a lot of what we do in this space is a little bit wonky. We are looking to certify that what people say is a renewable resource actually does meet the state's definitions of a renewable energy resource. Um, and we've got a whole team of folks that, that works um, in this space. We've also got our new solar homes program um, and other programs like that that help get uh, renewable energy deployed out into the marketplace. And then the sixth of our core responsibilities is to promote energy efficiency and conservation by setting the state's appliance and building energy efficiency standards. So um, we do all kinds of appliance standards in the areas where we're not preempted on the federal level by the Department of Energy. So if the Department of Energy has set a standard for a, a, um, an appliance or another piece of equipment, then the Energy Commission cannot set an energy efficiency standard in that space. But if the federal government has not set a standard, then we can. And so there's things like the screen for your monitor for your, for your computer, uh, other things like that where the Energy Commission has been able to come in, um, the set-top boxes that go with your cable, um, those use a ton more of energy, and so we were able to put in place energy efficiency standards for those. So those are the types of things that we can do energy efficiency standards for. And then we also do the building standards. So every three years, the Energy Commission um, does a, a deep dive into what's going on, what are the latest and greatest types of technologies, um, building materials, all kinds of things to make sure that the buildings that we are building are, that we are constructing are actually much more uh, energy efficient. So um, that is another thing that we do there. Those are rules and regulations that say how much energy a building can use. So those are the kind of the overarching six responsibilities. And as I mentioned, right, there's a little bit of everything that's related to uh, energy in that space. One of the things that I love about this chart, I always want to show this chart when I'm talking to people about energy, when I'm talking to people about the types of reductions we're trying to make in greenhouse gases in the state of California. And if you'll notice here, the top line of this slide shows you the GDP for California, um, our population, our greenhouse gas emissions, and our greenhouse gas emissions per person, and our greenhouse gas emissions per GDP. And you can see in California, our GDP is continuing to go up while we are making greenhouse gas uh, emission reductions. So it is not true that you um, can't make, if you make, it is not true that if you make emissions reductions, you also um, have a, a poor uh, economy. We have a very strong, very thriving economy in California. Um, and we have managed, to, we have decoupled our GDP from the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I don't have updated numbers on this with the coronavirus and, and what that um, economic slowdown looks like. Um, but the last that I heard, California is still the fifth largest economy in the world, right? Fifth largest economy in the world. And we are reducing greenhouse gas emissions per capita each and every day. You, you can do it. So I just, I always like to show this slide to make, help make that point. Here is a slide that kind of shows you where all of the, um, greenhouse gas emissions in the state are coming from. So you can see here, as I mentioned earlier, that most of our greenhouse gas emissions in the state of California are coming from the transportation sector. Uh, about 15% are coming from the electric sector um, and 21% from the industrial sector. So there's still a lot of work that we need to do across all parts of California's economy to really um, tighten up our greenhouse gas uh, emissions reduction but this gives you a sense of where the emissions are coming from. Um, and I don't think I really need to tell um, any of the folks here uh, listening, California's climate is changing. Climate change is real, climate change is happening. Um, and so this just kind of shows you some of the statistics about things that we're worried about here in California um, over the next little bit and we have done this is from the fourth california uh, climate assessment and it shows you some of the the types of impacts that we expect to see in california so if we don't start aggressively addressing climate change right now every day some of these extreme weather events um, and impacts are both increased in frequency and intensity that can include as you see here the erosion of our beaches 
large portions of the state um, are experiencing wildfires, which I don't need to tell anybody um, about. We're also seeing heavy rain and drought in areas and times that we aren't, weren't anticipating it from before. And we're seeing um, an increasing number of high heat days. So one of the things that California is working on to help us um, make those emissions reductions that we need to make is getting to 100% clean energy standard. So you can see in uh, 2018, we were at 34% and we are headed to 100% clean energy standard in 2045. The California Energy Commission is working with the Public Utilities Commission and the California Air Resources Board to complete a joint agency report that evaluates how do we get to 100% clean, 100% zero carbon electricity policy. And that, um, that report is on track to be completed by January 2021. It's been done um, with, a, with a strong public process. So if you, if you um, sign up on the Energy Commission's webpage, you can, you can track that. You can always be part of the workshops or provide comments on any of the things that we're working on. Um, a lot of times in our docket, we're really looking for great information, the latest data, the latest science um, on these topics to help guide us as we're shaping the policy, the direction, and the guidelines for where we're trying to go. So this is one of the solutions to help us get to those greenhouse gas reduction goals that we're needing to meet, um, again, in order to stay under two um, degrees Celsius. All right, so I want to jump back to the core responsibilities um, and talk to you about some of the research that we do at the Energy Commission to really help drive this progress forward. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm the lead commissioner on our research portfolio at the Commission. And it's, it's a really exciting portfolio of projects. So with these projects, what we're trying to do, as I mentioned, is advance California's clean energy goals. Um, and those are, as you can see here, decarbonization, affordability and equity, and our resiliency, right? So really increasing the resiliency of our system. Um, we're looking at some technologies that, that can help out in the face of wildfire or other natural disasters. Um, certainly, California cannot get where we are trying to go. No one around the world is going to be able to get where we're trying to go if we don't make sure that low-income communities, um, communities that are classified as disadvantaged under Cal Enviro screen, um, these are communities that have uh, historically and are currently facing undue burdens, undue pollution burdens. Um, so we need to relieve that, and we also need to help put these communities in a place where they can be the leaders. They can be the forefront of the clean energy goals. They can be the folks who are demonstrating and piloting the technologies and really show how it can work. Um, and we certainly cannot leave uh, these communities behind, low-income communities, rural communities, the disadvantaged communities, tribal communities, we need to make sure we're bringing everybody with us. And then uh, decarbonization. And I probably don't need to explain to you all, decarbonization, of course, is the key to reducing uh, uh, carbon emissions within our economy. But there's, there's a few things that we're working on in this space. There are three programs within the research program um, that I want to quickly highlight uh, the first two which is our food production investment program. Um, we've got a natural gas research deployment and demonstration program. And then I'm gonna spend the rest of the time that I have here with you guys this afternoon talking about our electric uh, program investment charge program. Um, or the, so we call it the EPIC program. So if you, if you say out the, the, the name, it doesn't, uh, doesn't go so smoothly. Electric program investment charge program, but EPIC program sounds good. Um, so. Let me talk to you about our uh, food production investment program. Basically what this does is it funds drop-in and emerging technologies at food processing facilities in California. Um, as you all probably know, much of the food processing for the entire country takes place here in California. Um, those industries tend to be, or they can be, pretty greenhouse gas intensive. They're energy intensive. They use a lot of water. And so we're working to really help reduce that, put in place uh, the latest and greatest state-of-the-art technologies that use a lot less energy and use a lot less water in this space. And so to date, uh, the Energy Commission has invested about $118 million in 48 projects throughout California. Uh, the map shows here this is a pretty good geographic diversity um, around the state. And the FPIP program is part of the California Climate Investments. And those reinvest profits from the cap and trade 
into state agency programs that are focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and also uh, for benefiting disadvantaged communities. So this, this program is uh, up and running right now and um, we're really excited to work with the food producers uh, around the state to reduce the emissions. And if you think back to that chart I showed a little bit ago, that it fits into that industrial category of the emissions, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we've also got our Pure Natural Gas Research Program. And um, as you can see here, what we're working to do, these are kind of the, the key tenets for the program, is to reduce some of the vulnerabilities and uh, fugitive methane emissions in our natural gas infrastructure. It's to help drive large scale customer adoption of energy efficient and low carbon technology solutions for natural gas end uses. And it helps to um, improve the cost competitiveness of renewable natural gas, as well as minimize the air quality impacts from natural gas use with zero or near zero um, emission technologies. And these pictures here that I have for you are showing you a natural gas hybrid electric nut harvester. So, you know, we we'll work with the industries we have here in California. The middle picture is a prototype of a combined cooling, heating, and power system that uses woody biomass as a feedstock. So this type of system could potentially be used for on-site production of electricity using forest biomass. And the bottom picture shows you a truck that is mounted with a portable LIDAR system. And it takes measurements of subsidence and sea level rise um, that could compromise the natural gas system. So it's really trying to understand where the um, impacts that we're seeing of climate change could impact our natural gas system. We are also looking up in this program as the state makes a transition away from fossil gas to more renewable gas. Um, what, what does that mean? What does that look like, right? What kind of analysis, what kind of questions does the state need to ask? What do we need to know to make smart policies in that kind of a transition. All right, and then I am going to turn now to our EPIC program. Uh, again, that's the Electric Program Investment Charge. And this is the largest program that the Energy Commission administers. We're really proud of it. And I'm excited to tell you all that it has been going on since 2011 and was just uh, renewed by the California Public Utilities Commission in August for 10 more years. So we're really excited about the strong and consistent signal, the renewal of this research program um, shows to clean energy innovators and entrepreneurs and um, technology folks. The state is serious about um, climate change. We're serious about finding solutions. And we've got uh, another a fund uh, for 10 more years that's going to help, um, help us to get there. So with our EPIC program, we invest, the Energy Commission invests about $130 million annually into clean energy innovation. And that clean energy innovation falls into these kind of six topics. And these six topics sort of tie back to the, the pillars that I talked to you about earlier of what the Energy Commission accomplishes, uh, not exactly in a one-to-one -one way, but um, it, it, it does tie back to, again, um, making sure that power is affordable um, and reliable to um, helping the state achieve its decarbonization goals, right? So, so everything that we're working on kind of fits in that broader bailiwick. So let's go through these six areas. All right, so the first area is, and, and they're in no particular um, order here, but um, the, the first one is nurturing innovation. So to date, the Energy Commission has invested about $720 million in more than 330 projects around the state. These investments have directly leveraged over $405 million in match funding. And you can see here how that funding breaks out across the different funding priorities. So we've got what we call our entrepreneurial ecosystem. There's about $143 million there. I talked about the importance of resiliency and safety in our grid. There's 106 million there. And we talked about uh, how buildings and transportation are a big chunk also of the, the greenhouse gas um, portfolio in the state. So we're investing dollars there as well. Transportation is a little bit smaller here, but that's because we've got the $100 million program, clean transportation program that can help uh, complement the research that we're carrying out in this space. Um, and then of course, looking at grid decarbonization and decentralization, and also looking at the uh, industrial and agricultural innovation within the state. 
So with the EPIC program, our goal is really to help move new and innovative clean energy technologies through the, what I call the, the innovation pipeline. And basically it's to, to take an idea, somebody's got a great idea in their head and they're trying to figure out how do I, how do I um, make myself a prototype? How do I then manufacture that prototype in a smart and efficient way? And then how do I get that um, out into the marketplace in a way that people can adopt it and it, it starts either you know, reducing the amount of energy we use, reducing the amount of um, greenhouse gases associated with it, reducing the amount of water, those types of things. So you can see here kind of that innovation pipeline. And the Energy Commission works in this, this early stage. Once you're out of the research and demonstration space and you're out into a mature market, uh, this is not a deployment program, right? So it, it, it doesn't deploy technologies or help buy down technologies to, to get them deployed in a much faster way into, um, into the marketplace, but we kind of get them all the way up to that spot. Part of what makes the program so successful, I think, is that we've leveraged um, expertise throughout the state. So we've created a robust network of scientists, entrepreneurs, technology developers, communities, academia, local government, and others. And as you can see on the slide here, um, we have had projects with over 100 different companies and government entities with nonprofits, utilities, universities, and national labs. These just reflect the prime recipients. Um, behind each of those prime recipients, there's usually a number of partners working on the projects as well. So you've got lots of, lots of, of subcontractors who are also helping out with this. But again, we're really excited about the geographic distribution of these, um, these projects and our funds across the state and uh, 450 research demonstration and deployment sites at early adopter homes and businesses. So I, I think that's actually pretty cool. Um, I mentioned previously benefiting all Californians. So the legislature, the governor, um, my fellow commissioners and I, we've all made energy uh, equity a policy priority. And that means that we need to ensure that the benefits from our programs are equitably shared um, and especially go to those who are in the most vulnerable communities. The Energy Commission, through our EPIC program, is helping to advance this priority by demonstrating new energy technology packages in disadvantaged communities to validate their performance and benefits to the community. And we do this in a couple of ways. When we evaluate the demonstration projects, a portion of the scoring criteria focuses on energy benefits and health benefits to low income and disadvantaged communities. We often retire that, uh, require that a community-based organization be included in the project. And we look at their plans for community engagement throughout the project. The point is not to have somebody with a great idea um, drop it on top of the community. The point is really to have a community strong engagement with the community. What is it that they need? What is it that they're looking for in this space? And, um, and how do we work together to demonstrate some of those technologies um, in the communities in a way that's really meaningful and impactful? And we're also trying to build and strengthen our relationships with community-based organizations to help get uh, better engagement and involvement from communities that may not regularly participate in programs like EPIC. Um, one of the challenges is that you have to know how to apply for grants in a state system to be able to successfully um, get grants in the state system. And so that's a little bit of a challenge. So what happens is you end up with folks who are really good at that and they oftentimes win a lot of the projects. Um, and if you are a, a community and you don't have, you have, you don't have a grant writer on staff, it makes it a little bit challenging. And so we really want to, to put those two um, resources together, the communities and the grant writers in a way that they can, um, um, that everyone can apply to, to help these, make sure these projects really do benefit all Californians. And uh, as of the end of last year, about 29% of our demonstration funding had been invested in projects in disadvantaged communities, and an additional 36% had been in projects that are um, low income but not disadvantaged. And again, as I mentioned, um, disadvantaged communities are defined by uh, the Cal Enviro screen. You can find that on the California Environmental Protection Agency's uh, website, but it has a certain set of criteria that, that determines whether communities are disadvantaged or not. And that doesn't always um, overlap with where the low income communities in the state are. 
All right, so we talked about nurturing innovation. Now I want to talk with you a little bit about some of the projects we're doing in uh, energy efficiency and load flexibility. So, um, and, and we talked also about uh, buildings and how much buildings are a part of the greenhouse gas emissions. They account for about 25% actually of the greenhouse gas emissions in the state. And the EPIC program is investing in new energy technologies to improve the affordability, the health and comfort of California's residential and commercial buildings. That includes investing in technologies such as better building envelopes. Uh, and if you're, not, if you're not a builder, really what that means is uh, you, make, you make the materials and put the building together in a smart way so that if I'm trying to cool it off because it's 95 degrees here in Sacramento, it stays cool inside my house. And if I'm trying to warm it up because it's 20 degrees and snowing, it stays warm inside the house, right? You want a really tight building envelope so that you're not using lots and lots of, of energy to, um, if your house is leaky, right? So that's what building envelopes are. Um, we're looking at more efficient HVAC systems. We're looking at demand response technology and reducing plug loads, among other things. So I'll give you a few examples of the projects that we're looking at um, under the building efficiency space. So we are working to increase the solar, let's see, yeah, increasing the solar reflectance of a building's envelope reduces the solar heat gain and it can also help cool the surrounding outside air. So we have the current data right now is insufficient for accurately predicting savings from different cool, so they call those cool walls, right, or cool roofs. Um, it's the, the data that we have is not sufficient for accurately predicting the savings that you get from these different types of cool wall materials. So under one of our EPIC funded projects, we're working with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to quantify the energy savings, the peak demand reduction, urban cooling, and air quality improvements attainable from cool walls. This is the first project designed to quantify cool wall benefits. And LBNL found that overall cool wall technologies have the potential to provide an annual energy cost savings of $500 million across single family homes in California. And so they're now working to develop cool wall measures um, that can go into the codes and standards for California. Um, another example of this is working with a group called OmConnect. And they developed a social media platform that encourages real time customer responses to demand response signals. And as of mid-2019, they had over 10,000 devices connected to their platform, and that has yielded a cumulative savings of nearly 30 megawatts. The project demonstrates that residential customers are willing to manage their electric loads for the purpose of meeting grid needs when presented with the meaningful, actionable information and that they have uh, salient incentives to, to encourage them to do so. So this type of technology, as you guys can imagine, will be super handy if um, we're in another space where we're reaching out to folks with flex alerts and we're asking people to uh, reduce their energy use. This gives you the opportunity to reduce your energy use and also get paid for it. Um, so this is a little bit of an older project and it was funded under a, a previous program that was a predecessor to um, EPIC but I wanted to highlight it because it is an example of where a $300,000 investment led to the development of a commercial product. So with the support of the CEC research funding, UC Davis developed an advanced aerosol sealant to better seal building envelopes. Traditional sealing is a labor intensive process and it sometimes is ineffective depending on what folks were using. This aerosol sealant was demonstrated to reduce the leakage by up to 64% in existing homes. Um, and a fun fact is that this technology was featured on this old house uh, for those of you like me who are old enough to remember that show. <laughs> um, so let's go on to the third priority, which is renewable generation. Um, this slide here highlights two of the projects targeted at increasing renewable generation through improved efficiency of photovoltaic tracking. So the first company that I'll talk about here is called Sunfolding. Um, they installed and tested a unique PV system with air-driven trackers. The air-driven trackers not only reduce the direct product cost compared to traditional tracking systems, but they also simplify the construction and operation of the PV systems. R&D from this project has led to the installation of 14 commercial projects in California. 
On the second project, um, historically, PV solar is usually installed on flat land. Um, but Novato's Engineering developed a PV tracking system that was suitable for sloped and rolling terrain. This helps solar developers build projects on lands closer to load centers and interconnection points that would typically not be considered because they're not flat enough when you're creating, and that creates more site options for where solar can go. The R&D efforts have led to the installation of two commercial projects in this example. Another focus for California and for us at the Energy Commission is looking at the ways to decarbonize our organic waste. This includes urban waste, woody biomass, and agricultural waste, among others. So here are um, two project examples. And what I really wanted to do by providing all these project examples in each of these areas is just give you a sense for the breadth of the types of research projects that we're undertaking. Um, there are lots of places where we can eke out um, emissions reductions, where we can eke out um, some energy efficient savings and some water savings. And we're looking at all of those because, as you know, we need all of it now and faster if we're going to meet these climate goals, right? And, and again, meeting our climate goals so that we stay under two degrees Celsius to me is uh, incredibly important. Um, so anyway, so these are these projects are, you know, research looking into a lot of the different spaces where we might be able to get, uh, gather these types of greenhouse gas um, reductions around the state. So as I mentioned, we're looking at a way to decarbonize organic waste in the state. And that includes the urban waste, the woody biomass, and some agricultural waste, among others. So two project examples here for you. Um, on the left, we have a dairy waste project in which advanced waste lagoon digesters were installed to process dairy manure into biogas. The biogas is then used to generate renewable electricity to export to the grid. This project is innovative in that it is the first demonstration of a hub and spoke dairy digester cluster in which multiple dairies pool their interest across multiple biogas projects. Um, and and we, you really need that kind of scale to make the, the projects um, cost out. So this project generates about 20,000 megawatts of renewable electricity annually, and it reduces the methane emissions associated with the dairy waste from several dairies. On the right side, I show a project that demonstrates a dry digester for converting food waste into renewable electricity. This is the first time the dry digester technology has been installed and demonstrated in the United States. And this demonstration project is expected to process 36,000 tons of food waste into 6.2 million kilowatt hours of renewable electricity annually. Okay, let's talk a little bit about storage and grid integration. So storage, as you all know, is anticipated to be a large part of our grid as we work to decarbonize our electric system. As we look to the future and plan for the storage we are projecting will be needed, it's important to think about the long-term perspective. Currently, over 90% of the storage in California is lithium ion. And we recognize that the state should not rely on only one technology. So it's important that we work to diversify our portfolio of storage solutions. At the commission, when, the mapping out, uh, when we were mapping out our storage research investments, we take a three-prong approach. We're looking to diversify, demonstrate, and also de-risk. And to date, we have or are funding demonstrations of flow batteries, advanced batteries based on zinc, uh, flywheels, and thermal energy storage. Uh, one of the reasons that we're doing this is typically the storage lasts you for about four or six hours, depending on uh, it, the, the output and how much you're using. And in some instances, we're going to need longer term storage, 10 hours or more, right? And so we just need a, different types of technologies to help us um, as we store more energy and make a move to more renewables. So let me give you a couple of examples here. We have uh, EOS Energy Storage. They offer a zinc hybrid cathode battery, which is an aqueous zinc-based battery technology that is inherently safer than competing technologies like lithium ion because of its non-flammable and non-toxic characteristics. EOS received a $2 million grant from the Energy Commission to pilot a 125 kilowatt alternative current energy storage system. This system is being installed and tested at PG&E's testing facility in San Ramon, 
where they will look at a variety of use cases, including peak shaving, ancillary services, load following, and frequency regulation. As a result of the EPIC grant, EOS was able to reduce their system cost by 54%, and they were also able to secure over $95 million in follow-on investment. So that's one of the other things that I think is exciting about the EPIC program. A lot of times uh, when we provide awards, the due diligence that the Energy Commission has done gives the public sector, gives the private sector the um, confidence to, to invest in these types of technologies. So let's talk here a little bit about this flywheel um, that we have. The flywheel is achieving a 50% cost reduction and we awarded Amber Kinetics a $2 million grant to support a demonstration project and of advanced flywheel technology to explore opportunities and to reduce manufacturing costs. Building off of that grant, Amber Kinetics was able to develop advanced manufacturing techniques, improve their design, and perform a safety validation testing on their flywheel um, demonstration project. They um, also, like EOS, were able to go on to receive follow-on funding, and they got about $50 million of follow-on funding for their technology. Another area that the Energy Commission has been focused on, particularly over the last few years, um, and in light of the wildfires and our public safety power shutoff events, are microgrids. The Energy Commission has a long history of investing in microgrids, and we've invested nearly $90 million in about 40 different microgrid projects. Earlier research um, focused on developing the controller technology and integrating multiple resource technologies, and more recently, we're looking at addressing the challenges of moving from research in the microgrid space to com commercialization. Uh, one of the challenges has been that each of these microgrids is kind of like its own special snowflake, and uh, they're very unique, and they're awesome, and they work really well in this, the spot where they're supposed to work, but they're difficult to scale, they're difficult to, to replicate. So that's one of the things that we're looking at. Um, I want to highlight one of these projects here, which is the Blue Lake Rancheria, uh, the Energy Commission provided a $5 million grant, and this ha um, microgrid has been online since about 2017. And uh, during a public safety power shutoff in 2019, the system was able to successfully island the area of the Blue Lake Rancheria for 24 hours, and it provided power to 10,000 people. So it really did do what it was supposed to do, and it saved the Blue Lake Rancheria over $200,000 in reduced energy costs over the course of 2019. Um, there's another microgrid that we have here in the Fremont Fire Station, um, and this is another one where uh, during the 2019 public, so public safety power shutoff event, Fremont, the City of Fremont Sustainability Manager was quoted as saying, it gives us a great sense of security and resiliency. We can operate without having to worry about the grid going out. So that's, that's the, the type of um, thing that microgrids give to folks. Microgrids aren't a solution for everything, but there are lots of places where microgrids are um, excellent solutions. And one of the things the Energy Commission is also looking at is where are those places and how do we get um, microgrids there. Two more topics for me to talk about, and I recognize that I'm just about at time, so I'll go a little bit faster um, for, for you, but I, I just, I love these projects. They're so exciting and fun to talk about, and I, I just really like the, the research space that we're within. Um, so the next topic is about electrification. Um, and so one of the things in this space is how do we electrify grocery stores? Supermarkets and grocery stores have some of the highest energy use among commercial buildings, and the majority of their energy is spent on um, refrigeration. So the Energy Commission and Prospect Silicon Valley are working together to implement a cost-effective energy efficiency upgrade package for grocery stores. Um, this project is taking place um, in the Bay Area, and they're working with a handful of local Whole Foods. So we're hopeful that documenting the cost savings and benefits that go along with electrifying some of the, the key loads within the grocery store um, and being able to document those cost savings and benefits will help influence others in the grocery market to make um, similar upgrades. We're also looking at battery electric buses delivering grid services. So one of the things that you can do with a battery as large as the battery that goes into a bus is when you're not using that bus, you can use that to provide, uh, it can either be storage for electricity or you can pull electricity back out of that battery and put it onto the grid. 
right? And so we're really trying to understand um, both what does that do to the batteries, but also um, how can you package that together in a way that the utility can depend on it and that the users can, can get paid for it. So that's the type of thing that we're looking to do. So that when we have a ton of um, transportation that's electrified, it's working with the grid in a smart way as, opposing, as opposed to just being a load um, on the grid. And then I want to talk briefly about our climate research and adaptation. And I'm going to go a little bit quickly through this because I do want to leave time to, to answer uh, some questions. Um, but we also find kind of what you might think about as like traditional science type research. So we do these climate change assessments um, and those talk a lot about, we're looking a lot at the wildland urban interface. We're looking at tree mortality. We're looking at extreme fire weather. Um, and we're also looking into next generation fire models. This is really important, I think, because previous fire models, what they would do is they would kind of look backwards and then based on that data, extrapolate out what we think is going to happen. Um, I, I, I don't need to tell anybody if you look at this year's fire season, that's not what fires are doing anymore. We just, we need updated fire science on what's happening um, right now in a world where we're already seeing the impacts of global warming and um, climate change. So I, I mentioned that um, already, we're looking at some wildfire risk management. Um, this is an award that we have put together again with Lawrence Berkeley National Labs. A lot of information here, but also the, the, the slides we will um, share with you so that you have a chance to, to really uh, dig into the data. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight um, and close about the EPIC program, which I, again, am just delighted to oversee, is that it really is making an impact in this space. And actually, I have an updated number. It's $2.2 .2 billion of private investment have been received by our project awardees after being selected for an EPIC project. So if you recall, I mentioned that we have about $130 million that we're able to invest um, each year. In, um, in transforming this sector and really looking into our research and technologies. And we're able to leverage that in just an amazing way, I think, by, by bringing in this private investment, this follow-on funding. Um, we're supporting small businesses. We are supporting organizations all across California. I mentioned before about 65% of the funds are being deployed in the disadvantaged and low-income communities that really need to see the change fast and first. Um, and need to be part of this clean energy transition that we're making. Um, and we get, we get cited all the time. So that's uh, pretty cool as well. I will wrap up with two uh, more quick slides, which is that um, we've got a group called Empower Innovation. Um, it is empowerinnovation.net. You can see it up there in the, the top right of the, of the slide here. This just brings together uh, entrepreneurs and communities and financers and everybody who's kind of in this energy ecosystem space so that they can connect, they can learn what different opportunities are, they can find partners, um, they can trade ideas. It's a really great space to be if you're excited about um, being part of this clean energy entrepreneurial ecosystem. So um, if you are, please do be sure to check out empowerinnovation.net and uh, sign up for it. Um, last but not least, I would be totally remiss in not mentioning that there are tons of wonderful jobs at the Energy Commission. I think it's a really fantastic place to work. So if you're a student and you're looking for a job, you can apply for an internship at the Commission. Um, if you're uh, graduating at the end of this year or um, in you know, May or June of next year, please do keep the state in mind as a great place to work. You can do meaningful work. You can do impactful work. And it really is moving the needle on clean energy, on climate. Um, and it's, it's just a fantastic place to work. So if anyone wants to reach out to me um, later about that, please feel free. Um, there is my information. And I know that the slides will get shared with you so that you'll, you'll have that um, later to, to be able to reach out to me if you'd like to. Be, I'd be happy to hear from anyone. So hopefully, I left enough time here for some um, questions. Thanks very much, uh, Commissioner Scott, for that uh, outstanding, comprehensive, and uh, highly um, uh, inspiring uh, talk. Uh, particularly like the uh, the uh, opportunities for uh, uh, soon to graduate uh, students. Uh, how do you reach out to low income and minority communities? So I guess it's are the are the big big boys uh, playing ball, collaborating, cooperating. Uh, 
making it harder to do your job on the one side and on the other side, uh, given that they don't have a lot of resources, what ways have you used to get them involved in how you, um, how you uh, configure your program, select projects, et cetera? You did say there are incentive funds, particularly for the low income, uh, low income communities, but you actually said they sometimes have trouble. Do you actually help them find people who can help them write grants at that point or, or uh, what, what, what's your approach uh, uh, in, that, in that dimension? Yep, yeah, those are fantastic questions. In terms of the, the, the big fossil fuel industry, typically I, I don't work with them or hear from them all that often. Um, I think it's just because this is a, the, the research program is a grant program. It's, it's aimed at entrepreneurs that are looking for um, some, some um, you know, to, to, to try to bring a great idea out into the marketplace. Um, when I worked on the transportation side, we did work with folks like um, Shell and others, especially as we were working to stand up some of those hydrogen refueling stations. They were very interested in um, getting into that business. Um, so I think a lot of times it depends on what that grant opportunity is, who's looking to work closely with us. Um, on the, the low income and disadvantaged community side, that is always uh, we're always just trying to do additional outreach right and um, make sure that the communities know that we have these different opportunities available um, sometimes if there's legislators that are interested we'll ask them would you please share the you know the link to the opportunity in your newsletter to the community right like there's there, there are a lot of different ways i think to reach out to the the communities in this space and we're always looking for for ideas um, because one challenge in the clean energy space is if you are a clean energy person or an energy person, you know about the Energy Commission, and otherwise you've probably never heard of us. <laughs> and there's no in between. And so it's a little bit challenging to, to do that, that type of outreach. Um, we're also hoping that Empower Innovation will allow communities and community members to jump on and talk about needs of of their particular community and then entrepreneurs who think that they have um, a good solution for that. And, and, and then they can make that connection without us, right? We've, we've done the, we've provided the platform, but allow the, the community and the entrepreneurs to, to reach out to one another or the grant makers and, and others to kind of reach out to one another on that platform. Uh, next question is, uh, 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 given the global nature of the climate problem, uh, how much of your time do you spend interacting with people outside the state on R&D program priorities ways to select projects. Uh, we even got an explicit question on RPE. Do you look at that as a, a model to, mm -hmm. some, so, uh, to some degree? And even I've actually been involved a little bit just in accounting standards with other jurisdictions to make sure that imports and exports, you, I'm sure you get this question a lot, imports and exports are, uh, of uh, greenhouse gases are effectively accounted for in the California context. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, we all tr truly recognize the global challenge that uh, climate change presents. I think California has been um, and continues to be a leader in this space. And so a lot of times, uh, well, when, when we could travel, when we could travel, we had delegation, foreign delegations coming through the Energy Commission at least once a week, probably more often to, to hear what it is that we're working on. And my fellow commissioners and I, folks that run some of the other programs, the directors who run the program, often get invited to go to other countries and present what, what California is doing for just that reason, right? Um, and again, we haven't been able to do any travel. No one's been able to travel since, since March, um, but to, to continuing to have that dialogue through phone calls and Zooms and things like that, that's kind of how we, we spread the word. Uh, both nationally and internationally. We do have an MOU with ARPA-E uh, to work together. And we've got um, both ARPA-E and the Energy Commission have grant programs where if you're an entrepreneur, you've gotten a grant through ARPA-E, now you're ready for the next stage. ARPA-E is not funding it, but the Energy Commission is. You can kind of come to us for follow-on funding from your ARPA-E project and vice versa. So we really try to help um, support the researchers in that space and as you're kind of making your way through that um, innovation pipeline whether it's through doe or through energy commission we're complementing our, our programs work hard to try to complement one another uh two more quick questions one is uh yeah. you uh, talked a lot about buildings which is crucially important and large uh 
what has been the effect of COVID? I mean, uh, not being an epidemiologist or anything, uh, it seems like there will be a lot more need for uh, better and more aggressive ventilation. I guess the question that the audience asks is, is that, does that play off against your building shell, kind of both the, um, uh, the reflective nature and the ceiling of the, the buildings? I'm sure you've thought about uh, this at the Energy Commission. What, what, what's, what's the solution to uh, both have more efficient buildings, but also have better uh, ventilation in the preventing the virus from spreading? Yeah, absolutely. And as we worked on those building standards, one of the things that uh, we looked at, if you're making a tighter building envelope, your indoor air quality is critical, right? And so you, we have got to make sure that the indoor air quality is, um, it is healthy, right? It's at healthy levels. It's, it's just as clean as it can be. So there's things that you have to work on in terms of how much um, outdoor air comes in. Right, so you got you have to have good airflow um, and, and that type of thing. So we certainly have um, thought that through. I'm sorry, I'm not the building engineer. I'm sure they're crying as they hear my answer here <laughs> when I talk about airflow and kind of bringing in um, cleaner air from out, um, bringing in the, the, it's the air circulation, right? And um, there's also technologies where you can have uh, ceiling fans and things like that that actually help circulate the air a little bit better than just having a vent that's maybe in one corner of the office and that person's under the vent and they're either freezing or they're way too hot and the other part of the office isn't getting that air circulation. There's a, there's a lot of air circulation types of things that we need to think about and um, work on as, as um, COVID. Um, and just because we need, if you're gonna tighten up a building envelope like that, you want the air quality to be healthy inside anyway. Super duper, yeah. Yeah, one last question is a transition to your post-seminar student discussion, which I, we appreciate your being willing uh, to do from a student. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, is um, uh, what is the biggest opposition? What, where do you see the biggest opposition to California achieving its climate and energy goals coming from? I thought that would be interesting because you're in a very political organization with many programs of many types, but you're in the R and D part, so. How do you respond mm -hmm. to that question? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a great question. I actually think that the part to me that keeps me up at night that's the most challenging, I think, is our transportation sector, right? So it's it is forty percent of the greenhouse gases in the state. This is this is a it's a it's a personal choice. Um, we've got 30 million cars on the road in California and another million or so medium duty, heavy duty. That's a lot of vehicles. That is a lot of turnover that you that we will need to see, right, in the next 10 years, right? 2030, 2035 is 10, 15 years from now. Um, when if, if you buy a car today, you are likely to keep it for 12 or 15 years before you buy your next car, right? And so the amount of turnover in the time that we have is... Uh, it's challenging, right? It's astonishing. It's staggering. It, it does keep me up at night to think through what is it that we need to do to make that transition, make it go as fast as we need to. And on, on the on the back end of it, I, you know, I'm part of this energy Twitter. And one of the things that they said that um, was, was vaguely terrifying for me is um, uh, this, this might not be the worst fire season in the last 10 years, but the, or, or the, or the worst climate impacts that we've seen in the last, for the previous 10 years, this might be the best that we see in the next 10 or 20 years. Um, and that's, that's really scary, right? Climate is, uh, it's real. It's happening right now. And we've got to put solutions in place as fast as we can possibly go. Um, so I don't know if that's a great answer to your question, but I'm always trying to think about how do we accelerate things? How do we get people excited to to make those transitions? Well, uh, at that point, we uh, need to close down. So uh, speaking on behalf of the audience, uh, and apropos of your last response, uh, we were very grateful that you are in place in Sacramento and uh, working so hard on behalf of all of us. And I'd also like to thank the audience for asking some good questions that I hope that trend will continue into your student uh, session immediately following. So once again, thanks very much for doing this and we hope to see you sometime in the not too distant future here back on the farm, your alma mater. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, thanks so much for having me. I was glad to be here today. Super, thank you so much.